All I'm saying is that that's how you know it's real, okay? He really knows how it feels. I mean, I didn't think he was making it up, but it took all of this just to... to get it. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. Hey, are you doing alright? Hey guys, uh, first of all, I told you so. My bad for taking this long to get a video out, but um, hopefully you'll see soon that it's been worth it. I've been working really hard on this, and this project means quite a bit to me, so thank you for sticking around, uh, if you have. I want to start this video off with a story, because if there is one thing I want this video to come across, it's that the music that I'm about to talk about is very, very important to me. On July 21st, 2021, I sat down to listen to an album that had been recommended to me since I started this channel, uh, and it's called The Glow Part 2 by The Microphones. And honestly, I don't say this lightly, but that listen changed the way I have seen music uh, ever since ever since that moment. It's, it was incredibly eye-opening. I mean, literally, immediately after listening to it for the first time, I gave it a 10 out of 10 score, and within the next few weeks, it very quickly became not just my favorite album of all time, but my favorite piece of art in general. It even ended up becoming my most listened to album of the year, which is saying something because I first heard it very late into 2021. To say that this record had an impact on me and my life is an understatement. I mean, I even put music from this album in my first ever short film at film school, and I even found a way to write a, uh, a song off of a different album from the microphones into the script. So here I am, trying to share all of this with you. The emotions, good and bad, the history, and most importantly, the music. So please join me in taking a trip back to 1978 to a little town called Anna Cortez in Washington. This isn't gonna work out for you. What do you mean? You're using a 20 year old album as an instruction guide. How do you not see something wrong with that? I think I just see it differently than you do. Okay, but that doesn't make me wrong. You understand that, right? For those of you who don't already know, The Microphones is Phil Elverum. Oftentimes he'll collaborate and work with other musicians and other artists on his projects, but really, when it comes down to it, The Microphones is him. Phil Elverum, as I mentioned before, grew up in a town called Anna Cortez, Washington, where he would live until he graduated high school. His entire life he was surrounded by music, as his dad would oftentimes make him kid-friendly mixtapes with the sounds of the Beatles and the Beach Boys. In his developmental years, Phil was the most attracted to music that felt very melodramatic, and in due time that would make a lot of sense, because Phil himself would make music and art that reflects that. In high school, Phil began to branch out, discovering new genres of music, and eventually he began to pick up the tuba, and more importantly, the drums. At the age of 14, he even started his own band, called Newbert Circus, where he played the drums and wrote all the lyrics for the songs. It was also around this time that Phil began to learn the guitar, and discover more and more new music. I mean, there's even pictures of him out there at uh, Nirvana concerts being interviewed, which I think is awesome. I just love seeing um, those old pictures of musicians that you love just being normal fans. The most important moment out of all this early history, though, is by far when Phil realized that his local record store was run by Brett Lunsford, a member of the group Beat Happening. Phil was a massive fan of the group, and after hanging around the record store enough, Brett eventually ended up offering him a job there. But the reason why this moment was so important is because his job with the record store allowed him to record his own music in the back. Throughout the next two years, Phil would record four different mixtapes under two different names. Beautiful Face, which was put out underneath the name Mostly Clouds and Trees, as well as Microphone, Microphones Mix, and Wires Plus Chords, all which were put out underneath the name The Microphones. These early tapes are all very interesting for a couple of different reasons. The first being that they sound incredibly different from the sound that the microphones would soon adopt. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are definitely glimpses of things that could possibly evolve into what we know as the microphones today, but I mean, look at the tapes. There's a couple of hip hop beats on these things, and if you know the microphones, that's very out of character. Another thing that I think makes listening to these tapes very special is that you get to watch Phil grow and learn. <laughs> because really, at the end of the day, these mixtapes are just Phil figuring things out by himself. I mean, seriously, just take a look at the description of the music on his Bandcamp page. Quote, Working at the record bookstore, drinking sweet coffee, eating cookies and bagels, getting sloppy with recording, and just releasing everything. And when it comes down to it, that's what these are. Phil made and released everything he could. 
practice tapes, experiments, the whole lot of it. Anything he recorded, anything he was working on, he put out. And because of this, each release sees Phil slowly growing in skill. By the time Wires Plus Chords eventually came out in 1997, I think that Phil finally made something that sounded somewhat good, which is kind of saying something because like I mentioned, these are really sloppy practice tapes, but Wires Plus Chords really is something special because it mixes the vibe of him just figuring things out with music that I think actually has some merit to it. It would take two years after the release of Phil's initial mixtapes for him to find a label to put out his first studio album. In 1999, the Microphones released their debut LP, Don't Wake Me Up, and it's this project that starts Phil on his journey to creating his magnum opus. Don't Wake Me Up is the first of three albums put out in between The Microphone's debut mixtapes and my favorite album of all time, The Glow Part 2. This album really sees Phil lean into his love for the lo-fi, slacker rock, indie sound, and he also mixes it with this blend of noise pop and psychedelic folk. The album talks a lot about dreams and visions, and the music really reflects that in a lot of different ways. Songs like Here With Summer or I'm Getting Cold are really great examples of Phil using music to put the listener in his shoes. So what's the album actually about? Don't Wake Me Up tells the story of Phil and an ex-lover after they recently broke up, and both of them are going through it pretty hard. As a coping mechanism, each of them individually takes solace in their own dreams, envisioning the other person living their lives and being with them. However, whenever they get close to touching each other or being near each other in their own dreams, they start to fade away and are faced with the reality that they are in fact not together. Hence the title, Don't Wake Me Up. It's a beautiful and troubling concept that's put together perfectly through Phil's lyricism and instrumentals. And like I mentioned earlier, it's also very obvious that Don't Wake Me Up and all of the releases leading up to The Glow Part 2 are really building towards that album. And this of course becomes very obvious when you look at the title of the tracks. I'm Getting Cold, I'll Be In The Air, You Were In The Air, and I Felt You are all variants of songs that end up on The Glow Part 2. I also noticed that the opening riff of Florida Beach is very similar to the guitar riff on Samurai Sword, which is another song off of The Glow Part 2. This is why I say that at its best, Don't Wake Me Up is a great album that has something for everyone and a story that really any average listener can grasp onto. And at its worst, it's at the very least a record that proves that Phil Elverm is no stranger to heartbreak and has no problems with putting his heart on his sleeve and sharing that with the world. The next year, Phil released two albums. The first of the two is titled Window, and it's kind of a B-sides album in the way that it consists of six unheard tracks, and then the rest of the track list is demo tapes from Don't Wake Me Up. It's an interesting project because it really gives insight at to how Phil records his albums, but outside of that, there's not much to talk about here. The second album is called It Was Hot We Stayed In The Summer, and if you listen to this album, you'll likely have one of two reactions. If you have only listened to albums that Phil put out before It Was Hot We Stayed In The Water, you'll probably be very happy with how Phil's feeling on this album. Phil's gorgeous metaphors for finding someone finally after a breakup will make you fall in love with his music all over again. However, if you just listen to The Glow Part 2 and you're planning on listening to this afterwards, this project takes on a far more darker form. As I mentioned before, It Was Hot We Stayed In The Water tells the story of Phil learning to love himself and others after going through a very hard breakup. The same breakup, in fact, that was talked about on Don't Wake Me Up. This change in Phil's life is catalyzed by a woman that Phil describes as helping him find what he calls the glow again. 
Phil, very obviously, references something called the glow in almost all of his music. From what I can tell, the glow is what you see in someone that you find special. Call it love, call it friendship, call it whatever you want to. The glow is just that special something that you can see when you look at someone that you're you're attracted to or someone that you like being with. Music-wise, It Was Hot We Stayed in the Water is pretty fucking good. The opening track, The Pole, is not only one of my favorite songs by the microphones, but it also consists of one of the best drops in music history. I also think that Phil works very well with his backup vocalists on songs like The Gleam. And of course, the track The Glow is a great way to introduce his audience to the concept of the glow. Overall, It Was Hot We Stayed in the Water is a great project. Being such a fan of Phil and his music, it's incredible to watch him grow and find love and feel like he's becoming a better person because of it. But at the same time, it is absolutely fucking devastating. Because unfortunately and fortunately, the song The Glow comes with a sequel, and it is far less emotionally satisfying as anything off of this record. Have you ever considered that you're looking at this from the wrong perspective? The, the wrong perspective? How can I possibly see this from the wrong perspective? Well, let's just say for sake of argument, we all enter your imaginary fantasy land where somehow Phil Elvrum is the only guy on the planet who can relate to going through a hard breakup. H hold on, that's not what I'm saying. First of all, it kind of is. Second of all, let me finish before you cut me off. You're missing the entire context of what comes next. Jackson, Phil Elvrum married Genevieve two years after The Glow Part 2 came out. And even after she died, he remarried again afterwards. So what are you going to do? Are you going to move on from this one fucking event? Or are you going to sit around listening to the mood all day while you cripple your own mental health? The Glow Part 2, the sequel to Track 4 off of It Was Hot, We Stayed in the Water. I feel like the only place I can start when talking about this album is doing a track by track breakdown because this project, this record, this LP, whatever you want to call it, it's such a journey. The opening track, I Want Wind to Blow, delves into Phil's thoughts after he had a really big fight with his girlfriend that ended in the two of them splitting up. He describes wanting wind to blow, which I envision as wanting change in his life. Change in how he's feeling, change in scenery, change in people, interpret it however you like because really this record is very much so up to your interpretation and what you get out of it. The most important thing that I get out of the song is that Phil has just suffered a catastrophic loss of a beautiful relationship and all he wants in my eyes is to feel better. The next track, The Glow Part 2, starts out with booming drums that seemingly come out of nowhere and honestly scared me the first time I heard this album. When the guitars finally fade out, Phil's voice comes in and says what might be my favorite song lyric of all time. Quote, I took my shirt off in the yard and no one saw that the skin on my shoulders was golden. End quote. It's such a simple lyric, and yet I feel like so much is being said. Phil taking a shirt off in the yard represents him becoming vulnerable and exposing his emotions to other people. However, he feels like whenever he becomes vulnerable like this, people don't understand what he's trying to say or aren't even willing to listen to him at all. But what is it that Phil's taking a shirt off for? What is he saying that's so vulnerable? For the rest of the song, Phil is in what I can only describe as complete mental agony. He longs for death, and he hates the fact that he has these biological reminders that he's still alive. His blood flowing, his heart pumping, all of it, all of it makes him upset. Years later, Phil would reflect on the track, saying, quote, It is annoying to have to admit to yourself that you're still alive when you'd rather curl up in a ball and be sad and dark. Being annoyed at your heart for still beating. Not that I was actually suicidal or anything. I totally wasn't. Just a regular old relationship not working out. No big whoop. End quote. But if this isn't a perfect breakup describer, then what is? Right when it happens, the moment you split up, all you can think about is your ex-partner and, and how happy you'd be with them and how sad you are that they're not there and how much you just want to disappear. And obviously years later, you look back and you think, wow, how silly was I, how stupid was I to think that it wouldn't get better, to think that things wouldn't improve for myself. But right when it happens, all of those shitty thoughts that's your reality, and that's what Phil so perfectly captures on this song. Track 3, The Moon, sees Phil drive back to the place where his ex-partner grew up, and he's trying to purge himself of the memories they had together. This leads us directly into track 4, where after Phil has experienced this nostalgia tidal wave, he is now remembering everything that he's lost. Whenever I think of this song, the one lyric that comes to mind is, quote, 
I miss my closest friend, end quote. This person is so close to Phil that he feels like not only has he lost his lover, but also his best friend. And if that doesn't hit you like a fucking truck, I don't know what will. Moving on to track five, my roots are strong and deep, Phil envisions himself as the roots of a tree, reaching out to find his ex-partner in the dirt. Eventually he finds her, but is terrified at her size. This becomes a very common theme throughout the rest of the album. He feels very small compared to his ex, and this can mean a lot of different things. I choose to see it as the fear of talking to her again. Maybe he's intimidated by her, or maybe he's scared that they'll break out into another fight if he chooses to approach her. I mean, it can mean a million different things, but really watch out for this metaphor because it pops up a lot on this record. After a brief but memorable instrumental break, our story skips to track 7, The Mansion. This song is just pure, unfiltered thoughts of depression. Phil describes different ideas, like being stuck in a loop of sadness, or being trapped in a room with no escape route to get to being happy. It's an incredibly tough song to listen to, even if you prepare for it, so a heavy trigger warning if you choose to check this out. The next two songs, both titled Something, are entirely instrumental, but even without lyrics, they both kind of talk for themselves. The longing strings on the first Something are so incredibly haunting and lonely, it feels like a cassette tape from a funeral. Not to mention the manic and drony second version of something that makes me feel crazy inside, like something's gone incredibly wrong but I can't figure out what it is. These two songs, while very short, I think help the pacing of the album quite a bit. This lack of vocals almost halfway through the record allows for the listener to get kind of a break from Phil's vocals, and I think that really helps in realizing how important and how passionate Phil sounds on the rest of the album. After both of the somethings, the next track, I'll Not Contain You, follows a much more simple approach. The song only has Phil on vocals, guitar, and drums. It's simple, but the effect that these bare bones instruments have is pretty heavy. To be honest, the lyrics on this song are a bit more than I can personally comprehend, and this is probably the track that I connect to the least. But I can still get glimpses of Phil feeling like if he tries to approach his partner again, she'll feel overbearing by his presence and he wants to stay away from her and give her space, which is probably the right thing to do in this situation. The next song is the sequel to The Gleam, which was off of the previous album, It Was Hot, We Stayed in the Water. On this song, Phil talks about still being able to picture a future with his ex, but starting to realize that she doesn't want the same future that he does and that she feels like she's better off without him. The entire song features this crazy bass drum, almost like a really fucked up marching band, and it moves the track forward really well, I love it. The Gleam Part 2 then transitions really well into track 12, Map. Like I said, the Gleam Part 2 describes Phil being able to remember and see a future with his ex, but now on this next song, Map, he is struggling to remember her at all, or remember what happiness was like when he was with her. He can no longer remember her touch on his hands. He can no longer remember a time when they weren't apart. And that might be the most terrifying thought for a person going through a breakup to have. Instrumental-wise, Map is an absolutely fucking masterpiece of a song. It has this hectic buildup that sees Phil descending into madness, and it fits the lyricism of the song perfectly. The peak of the song has so many different sounds in it that if I tried to piece them together, I don't think I ever could. And frankly, I, I love it. I, lo I love it so much. In the next track, You'll Be In The Air, Phil watches his ex fly away from him into the air and out of his life completely. It, uh, it hurts. Anyways, I'm going to talk about the next four songs all in one big chunk because they all are kind of presented in I Am statements. I want to be cold, I am bored, I felt my size, and I felt your shape. There is an instrumental track snuck in between the last two songs, but I'm already on page 9 of the script, and we still have quite a lot to talk about, so just bear with me here. These four songs really come together to show this whirlwind of emotions that Phil has been feeling during the entirety of the breakup. On I Want To Be Cold, Phil talks about how he literally wants to die because he feels so shitty. Then on the next song, Phil talks about how even the small things him and his ex used to do together now feel completely empty without her. Like the song says, even being bored is harder without her. On I Felt My Shape, Phil once again uses this metaphor of feeling small to convey how he's feeling. Tiny, insignificant, and unimportant to the point where he feels like he's putting up emotional walls around him that no one can get into. Then we have I Felt Your Shape, which is in my opinion one of Phil's best written songs of all time. And the fact that it's just him and his guitar makes it that much better and important and hard hitting. But even with that being said, I still couldn't describe this song to you or to anybody in any amount of words. It just encapsulates so many different feelings and emotions that go beyond description and 
you just have to listen to it for yourself. I, I can't nail that home any harder. You just have to listen to this for yourself. All I know is that Phil misses her, and he can't take it any longer. Samurai Sword. The second to last song off of this album, and one of the most batshit crazy pieces of music I've ever heard, ever. First of all, right off the bat, we get these fucking crazy guitars. After one of the most quietest songs on the album, we get the loudest moment. This, this just massive descent into anger and fighting. Samurai Sword depicts Phil trying to cut down a polar bear with a samurai sword while they're in this snowy forest. Obviously, he's not talking about fighting with an actual polar bear. Um, a lot of people interpret this as him having a final fight with his ex, um, but I interpret it more as him having this final push to get over this breakup. You know, the polar bear describes all these shitty thoughts and feelings that he's been having throughout the whole album, and all he has to do is swing that sword right into the right into the polar bear's head. All he has to do is hit one final, one final hit, one final cut to take. He misses. He misses like really bad. And now we're here on the final track of the album, My Warm Blood. The first minute or two of this song starts out normal enough. After his unsuccessful fight with the polar bear, Phil is lying in the snow, bleeding out, waiting to die. It's tragic, but this isn't even the saddest part of the song. For the next seven minutes of the track, it's almost completely silent, except for a sound of a foghorn that Phil has been using in the background of most of the songs, actually. In the final few seconds or minutes of the song, you can very quietly make out the beginning chords of the first song, I Want Wind to Blow. When I first listened to this album, that moment is when everything clicked. It didn't matter that I missed most of the lyrical content on my first listen, because just that one sound was enough to sell me on the idea that Phil was trying to push. I've interpreted this part of the album in a lot of different ways. On good days, I see it as reminiscing on older times, but being allowed and being able to move on. On bad days, I see it as looking back and realizing that things will never be the same, and you'll never have her again. That's the moment when I fell in love with this album. Um, but what I didn't see coming is that four months later, I would mutually split up with my girlfriend of over two and a half years. It unfortunately happened over the phone while I was in my dorm, sitting exactly where I'm sitting right now. And um, after we ended the conversation, I called my parents and asked if I can come back home for the weekend because I just, I felt like I needed a familiar place to be at. And um, I just, I needed that. My college is about an hour and a half from my parents' house, and they had to come pick me up because I didn't have my car with me. And so during that time, I sat in this chair, and I put on The Glow Part 2, and I just, I listened. It's funny. I mean, not really funny, but I guess when I cry really hard, I hyperventilate, and that causes my arms to, to stiffen up. So I was, like, trying to get my AirPods in my ears like this, and I couldn't type properly. It was, I, I was a mess. I was a fucking mess. But I finally managed to type in the Glow Part 2, and the music started playing, and for the next hour and a half, I just... I fucking lost it. I hung onto every syllable that Phil Elver managed to get out of his mouth, and I I felt it, man. I, I felt it. For the next month, I lived with this piece of music. The best way I can describe it is from this review I found underneath uh, Don't Wake Me Up on Rate Your Music by a user named Earwax, which was fucking stupid, by the way. Quote, There are albums that I like or even adore, and then there are albums like this. Albums that seem to have been born from my being, or created by someone else who was constructing a sonic statue of me. This is me, and I am in the world." End quote. It was unhealthy. But looking back, it felt like this album was all I had. It was the only thing that I could relate to. I put up emotional walls. I, I just, I locked myself in my room and I listened, and that was it. I took a break from the podcast. I stopped all work on the channel. I cut myself off from my friends. It was horrible. Thankfully, I have really great friends, and their love for me and to see me get better shown through and help me get out of this slump that I was in. And eventually, it, it, it took a long time, but I overcame it. And I'm not gonna lie, I still have moments of weakness, and I'm sure everyone does. You listen to a song, or catch a glimpse of a lyric, or see something familiar, 
and you get a glimpse of what might have been or what could have been. But it's important to remember that things aren't different. Things are the way there are, and as much as I like to sit here and tell you that you can change that, you can't. I didn't make this video to change how things are for me. I made this video to prove that I could take my shirt off just like Phil did, because if doing that means that I can help one person get out of the shithole that is post-breakup depression, then all of this, every second of it, every, every fraction of hurt, every re-listen to of this album, every shot that it took to make this all come together is worth it to me. Okay? Because sometimes when you're trapped in a dark cave, it's hard to see the beautiful mountain that lies just around the corner. Hey. Hey. I, uh, I think I'm ready. Ready for what? I just, I want it to be over. I know. Hey, uh, listen. I, uh, got an album you might want to hear. After the release of The Glow Part 2, Phil put out an album titled Blood. It's once again a mostly behind-the-scenes album, much like Window, but it also features acoustic and alternate versions of songs that ended up on The Glow Part 2. I definitely recommend checking it out, but once again, I don't want to dwell on it a lot because, you know, they're just b-sides. After that, Phil released a compilation album titled Song Islands, which is basically just a collection of songs that Phil hadn't put out over the last few years. It once again also features a lot of b-sides and alternates from The Glow Part 2, so once again, we're just gonna move forward. A few months after that, Phil released an album titled Little Bird Flies Into a Big Black Cloud, which is kind of an interesting release. It also kind of piggybacks off of a lot of the ideas Phil talked about on The Glow Part 2, featuring sequels to songs and more alternate versions. But on top of that, it also fleshes out some of the songs off of Song Islands and sees them come into their own and fit a little bit better on this album. This is also one of the only The Microphones releases to not have any collaborators. It's just Phil, and he recorded it in one day, which I think is pretty damn impressive. But still, much like the last two releases, this just feels like another addition to The Glow Part 2. It doesn't feel like Phil is doing anything new here. But of course, knowing Phil, that's entirely not the case. Because during the time that Phil was releasing all this new music, he himself was taking a journey that would soon be released to the public. In 2003, the microphones released Mount Eerie, a five-track epic that matched the likes of the Odyssey. Looking at just the lyrics, it seems as though the story of this album starts on the beach. However, there is a 10-minute instrumental section before any lyrics come in that tell a story in and of themselves. And it starts out exactly where the glow part 2 ended. That's right, the foghorn sound that's played at the end of the final track of the glow part 2 with I Want Wind to Blow playing underneath is the first sound we hear on this record. But what does it mean and why did Phil feel the need to connect the glow part 2 with this album? Well we're in luck because Phil actually created an entire booklet called Headwaters that kind of explains a bit of the deeper meanings of this record without like completely giving it away. And in that booklet, Phil not only explains that yes, Mount Erie and the Globe Part 2 are connected, but he also adds on an extra part of it. He says that this 10 minute instrumental section with the marching band and all that signifies life before birth, a time when we grew before we even knew we existed. And this of course leads me to believe a couple of different things. The first is that the person that we knew in the Glow Part 2 is dead. And the second is that the album, Mount Eerie, is the rebirth of that man. Or to simplify what I just said, Phil is reinventing himself. In a handout that comes with the vinyl record, Phil described a near-death experience he had during a snowstorm on the top of a mountain while he was in his car, and I think that that experience put a lot of things into perspective for him. And so Mount Erie is the man that came out of that, the, this new and improved Phil who was rediscovering himself. And not just that, but Phil trying to piece himself together after the polar bear teared him apart. The rest of the first track, The Sun, as I said before, sees Phil on the shores of a beach watching all of his loved ones rowing away on a boat away from him. As he declares everything that he's feeling out loud, he notices that the sun above him is not just an object, but a being that's taking in everything that Phil is feeling. However, just as Phil is beginning to realize that all he has left is the sun, a big black ship appears
disappears over the horizon and forces Phil to run into the woods behind him and towards Mount Erie. The big black ship is a figure that appears a lot on this record, and in this situation it represents a change from day to night. So really, that whole sequence of Phil getting to know the sun is just him becoming comfortable in the day, and then the big black ship coming over the horizon with red sails signifies sunset and that it's changing from day to night. But if we look even deeper than that, you'll understand that this is all just one big metaphor for Phil being scared to leave his family and Phil being scared to be alone. Because remember, the inciting incident of this whole journey was Phil's loved ones sailing away on a ship, getting as far away as they can from him, almost like Phil is maybe going on tour, or maybe, I don't know, going through a breakup. It's a lot, I know, but we're making progress, okay, one song at a time. The next track, To Solar System, has Phil traveling through an empty creek bed as he makes his way towards Mount Erie. He has this blind faith that the mountain contains all of the answers and protection that he needs from this big black ship that's chasing him just off the shore. This entire track was inspired by a song called Fall Floods by a person that goes by Little Wings. Um, and if you want to learn more about Phil and his relationship with Little Wings, I highly, highly recommend the documentary Wise Old Little Boy that follows Phil and Little Wings uh, on a tour through Washington uh, just before this album came out. But anyways, back to the story. After making his way through the creek bed, we find ourselves on the third track, 3, Universe. Phil has finally made his way through the creek bed and now finds himself at the base of the mountain. He begins to climb the mountain, but as he does, a self-described close dark voice whispers the line, quote, do you really think there's anybody out there, end quote, into Phil's ear. This voice, in my opinion, obviously represents Phil's inner feelings, planting thoughts of self-doubt in his head. Is there really anybody out there for him? Anybody who would love him? Anybody who could even understand him? As Phil continues to make his way up the mountain, the voice of the all-consuming universe comes out of the sky and asks Phil what he really wants. But Phil doesn't know. All he does know is that the trail that he sees in front of him is familiar to him. He's been here before. To me, Phil traveling up this mountain represents the path to self-betterment. Phil wants to move on. Phil wants to continue his life without a fear of loneliness. But every time he tries to climb this mountain, every time he tries to better himself, he's met with the fact that, as he said on The Globe Part 2, there is no end. On the next track, for Mount Erie, Phil has made his way all the way to the top of the mountain. He sits at the top of a boulder and gazes over this beautiful landscape of trees until he finally notices the big black ship from earlier. However, now it comes to him in the form of a big black cloud. Phil has literally nowhere to run, so the big black cloud swallows him and crushes him, killing him instantly. Once he's finally dead, Phil's body gets torn apart and eaten by vultures, each of them taking a piece of him and flying away with it. While all this is happening, the big black cloud explains that the vultures are carrying parts of his soul into the great beyond. Each vulture has taken a little part of Phil with them. On the final track of the album, 5, The Universe, the vulture carry Phil's spirit into the infinite darkness that is the one true universe. And during all of this, Phil is joyous. He feels like now that he's in between death and being alive, he can see the true face of what is the infinite darkness that sits in front of him. And he loudly exclaims, that it looks just like him. It's these last two songs that are the hardest to wrap my head around, but I'll try to give my best interpretation because frankly, that's all I really have here. Like I mentioned before, Phil does have kind of an explanation book called Headwaters, but really it's very surface level shit and did not help me at all during the process of trying to dissect these songs. The scene of Phil being completely swallowed by the big black cloud represents him being completely eaten away by loneliness. It surrounds him, and it's at that moment, at the pinnacle, at the peak of Mount Erie, that Phil feels the most alone. But then, out of the darkness, the vultures carry him, piece by piece, into the one true universe. But like I said before, this isn't a sad moment. Phil is happy that he's being taken into the great unknown. But then again, is it really the great unknown? Phil seems to recognize his own face staring back at him while he's being carried into the darkness. This entire sequence, to me, is starting anew. I know, it's like a super fucking complicated way of saying that, but Phil is a pretty complicated guy, and when you break it down, it starts to make more and more sense. After the events of The Glow Part 2, Phil separates himself from his family and his friends, or as he says on track 1 off of Mount Erie, sends them away on a metaphorical boat. And after that, he battled off feelings of loneliness, trudging up the hill that is Mount Erie, thinking that he could take on the world and the loneliness by himself. But it caught up with him, and before he know it, he was completely alone and 
and totally miserable. But rescue came, picked him up, and took him back to a familiar time, a time when people loved him and he had people to love, a place that Phil had long been a stranger to, but was of course never unfamiliar with. So look, maybe that's what Phil meant. Or maybe that's just what I lived through and so therefore that's what I see. Art is supposed to be a mirror back on a society, but with Phil, it's a mirror back onto yourself. What you see is what you get, and oftentimes you get way more than you asked for. After Mount Erie came out, a couple of things happened. The first is that he released two different records, one being the drums from Mount Erie and the other being the vocals. The next thing Phil did was he dropped the name The Microphones and changed his name to Mount Erie. And since then, Phil has released over 20 different albums underneath the name Mount Erie. Phil said that he felt that the ideas they talked about on the album Mount Erie were so big that he felt like he needed to take on the name and to continue the path that he had found on that record. And to be honest, I don't blame him because after listening to Mount Erie, I feel like I left it with more questions than I did answers. In 2020, Phil brought back the name The Microphones with his release, The Microphones in 2020. But I'm not going to be talking about that release today because frankly, I can't. It's supposedly a culmination of all of his projects underneath both pseudonyms, and because I haven't gone down the Mount Erie rabbit hole yet, I just feel like I would be missing out. As we near the end of this video, I'll leave you all with this. When I approached the idea of doing a video about the microphones, I thought about doing it in a lot of different ways. The first was making an episode of my series I listen to so you don't have to after it, but that just felt too small to contain the big ideas that Phil was talking about. I just, I didn't want to do it like that. Then I thought about just doing a video about the Glow Part 2, but that didn't seem to be working very well either. I was trying way too hard to say what I felt, and it just, it felt impossible. How do I tell an audience of people how much this means to me? And the answer is, you don't. You show them. And most importantly, cherish every moment you have because you never know when a massive fucking cloud will crush you on top of the mountain and then you'll be eaten by vultures and sent into an infinite dark void. And if you ever find yourself in that situation, just remember, there's a reason why this video is called Why You Need to Listen to the Microphones. Thank you. Well? Thank you. That, um, that helped way more than I expected it to. Even though the darkness consumed him. He made it out okay. Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, he did.